Today's presentation is going to be in our residence series, the second part of protocol procedure and patient acceptance with implant dentures. Good morning, Adam Dreyfus, our national account manager for DSG, and he's going to take it away. Thank you so much, Jessica. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. I am so excited to have you on board today and joining us. I believe this is our eighth session together. I can't believe that we're already nearing the end of our journey of the residency program, but I want to thank you all for your continued support. Please know that I am locally in the market, and if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at any time. Most importantly, DSG and I have to thank you for your continued support, and we <clears throat> hope you're enjoying this education journey that we're taking together. With that being said, enough about me. I'd like to turn it over to our esteemed speaker and knowledgeable man, Dennis Urban. Dennis, take it away. All right, well, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Jessica. And good morning, everybody. And welcome back to part two of protocol, procedure, and patient acceptance on implant dentures. And uh, before we start today, I just wanna go over a little bit of a review before we get into part two. Uh, as you remember, the last time we, we spoke, uh, we talked about implant over dentures. And today we're gonna talk about hybrid type dentures, all on four, all on six, and the protocol and procedures that uh, make them a successful case. So you know, you know who I am. My my video is not working this morning, so I don't have a live feed of myself. But uh, you don't want to see me. You want to see the uh, the, the webinar. But uh, but uh, I have over forty years of experience in the dental industry, and uh, I, I love what I talk about. And I, I I talk about things that that are successful for for me, the patients, and the clinicians. So and that have been successful over the years. So uh, that's what we're going to approach this morning. So. As a review, you know, last time we spoke about the overdentures and uh, we talked about overdenture purposes and what are some of the overdenture purposes that we wanna create natural aesthetics, enhance facial appearance, compensate for that lost soft tissue and enhance the function of, of, of an occlusal function with the right occlusal scheme. And uh, we'll talk about uh, lingualized occlusion in a little while because that's the function of choice when it comes to implant dentures. And most patients can afford one type of implant open denture since they're less expensive than when the fixed prosthesis. And we also discussed uh, common mistakes with over dentures and things that happen during the protocol and planning uh, uh, according with when we're making an uh, implant over denture. And some of them are uh, poor treatment planning, uh, improper communication, distorted impressions, inaccurate master models as well as the working model, a poor fitting, uh, fitting framework, and the wrong choice of materials and attachments. And we covered this the last time. We really wanna make sure we have the right attachment system when we're making overdentures, uh, because as you have all that intraocclusal space to work with, but by the time you have the, your attachments, your denture, your teeth, your bar at times, it takes up a lot of room through that intraocclusal space. So uh, sometimes you might have to go with a lower profile attachment. And then we also covered the three basic types of implant dentures. One of them is uh, the mainly tissue implant supported overdenture with two prefabricated individual attachments are utilized. And the overdenture is mainly tissue borne. And the second one was a tissue implant supported overdenture where it was more implant foreign compared to the previous type. And we utilized two implants and a resilient bar attachment assembly uh, when we're making these types of overdentures. And then we have the fully implant supported overdenture or fully implant supported denture, which could be a hybrid type denture also. And that's when an attachment assembly that usually contains four or more implants is utilized. And the attachment assembly transfers all the masticatory forces to the supporting implants and minimal flange and tissue coverage is required. Then we talked about successful implant overdenture protocol. We wanted something that's gonna have a stress-free fit of the attachment assembly. That's gonna enable good oral hygiene for the patient. Biocompatibility of all the chosen materials, including acrylics and, and the materials that you're using. I, I also mentioned in a last uh, uh, webinar that it's so important to utilize a good denture tooth, a high quality denture tooth and the right acrylic, an acrylic that has flexural strength, but also has high impact resistance because those masticatory forces are a lot uh, more on, on an overdenture than they are on a, on a regular denture. And we wanna, have to, we wanna compensate for that. Functional and equilibrated occlusion, lingualized occlusion, of course, natural looking aesthetics, any absence of interfering with normal interference with normal phonetics. You know, at times we put so much, so many materials in the mouth, there's not enough room for that patient to have normal phonetics. 
and of course the expertise between the dentist and the, and the lab technician in collaborating and planning the case and the communication between all of us, including the, uh, the uh, oral surgeon. Then we also discussed with or without a bar. How do we decide you know, whether to have a bar on an overdenture case uh, or without a bar? Well, with a bar, with a bar, a bar can achieve evenly distributed forces between dental implants. And the direct method with an overdenture attachment incorporated into the denture base without a mill bar costs less and requires less vertical room. And the final case design is determined by what we have to work with intraorally. You know, sometimes we just can't utilize a bar when we're making these types of cases. And both methods require support from the tissue and the attachments. And keep in mind that the denture rests on the soft tissue and the attachments act only as a retentive element, preventing the denture from dislodging. And some of the considerations with attachments only, an ideal ridge structure is needed. For instance, a lower full denture on a patient with an ideal ridge and good bone structure can easily have over denture attachments placed into the final denture without the use of a mill bar. And we wanna make sure a metal substructure is placed internally for strength. And upper denture will be functional just with attachments if the patient's bite is an ideal one, class one occlusion. And some of the deciding factors we discussed for bar assembly is often the anterior flange of an upper has mobility. And if the patient is, an, it is not an ideal occlusion, this causes a mesiodistal rock that can put all the stress on the attachments. And this is when we consider a mill bar assembly. And if the patient has a flat ridge, there'll be no tissue support. So all of the pressure will be on the attachments and if possible, a fixed case is better. And a bar with the horizontal lock attachment, that acts as a sort of fixed patient removable prosthesis. We also talked about attachment choices. We went over the locator attachment for, for implants, for root attachments, for bar attachments. And that's probably one of the most widely used uh, attachment systems on the market. We also talked about ERA attachments. It was the same protocol with implants and roots and, uh, and over a bar. And then we talked about the lower profile Ryan 83 attachment, as you can see here, is a smaller profile than a locator. And we wanted to also include the internal strengthener support uh, uh, as far as uh, making these types of cases, because without that internal strengthener support on these overdenture cases, you're going to have breakage and you're gonna have breakage right near the, where the attachment is. So as you can see here, we have a mesh support inter internally on this lower denture. On this one, we have an upper horseshoe type uh, framework for support. This is a cast mesh support in this one. And then we have the newer types of options here with uh, uh, super polymer materials like a peak or a pectin that can be scanned and milled. And it's very lightweight and aesthetic. And finally, we talked about divergency issues. Not every case is perfect. So we have to compensate for those the divergency issues. And many of these attachment systems out there compensate for that, that divergency issues. I know with uh, Ryan 83, it goes up to, I think, 30 degrees. Uh, with the new uh, attachments uh, uh, with locator, it go up to 60 degrees of divergency correction. So really important when you, you have something that's not that, that, that is divergent, and you don't want those caps to wear out on a, on a regular basis, and it gives you better retention. So with that, let's get into part two, a protocol, procedure, and patient acceptance on implant dentures. So we're going to start off with all in four and all in six. I'm sure, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. You know, when it comes to all in four and all in six, I like to see at least six implants on an, on an upper when we're doing these types of cases. Because all in four is great, but if one implant fails, then you know, you know we only have three left. At least we'll have five left if one implant fails with, a, with an upper. So the implant placement on these types of cases, well, there's a tilted implant placement with four or more implants. And the posterior most implant is tilted at least 45 degrees or less. It's a graftless procedure and bone grafting is avoided by tilting the posterior implants and utilizing available bone. It's an immediate function of fixed provisional denture for fixed uh, denture or bridge. And it's for patients meeting the criteria for immediate loading of implants. And if you're placing six or more implants on a vertical, you just, all you have to do is place them vertical. You don't need to uh, angulate those, in, uh, those implants, but sinus grafting may be necessary on these types of implants. And you look at all the four, uh, all the four treatment facts over the years. It's been a very high survival rate, a very positive rate over the years, um, and with long-term uh, rates from five to ten years. And this is uh, this this slide is, is about three or four years old. So the success rate has been very, very good, and uh, stable marginal bone levels and healthy soft tissue for both tilted and axial implants over time. 
So it's a great treatment, uh, at this on four on all on six. So there's some uh, radiographic images of how those tilted implants are on these all on four, all on six type of cases. And many times we're using these multi-unit abutment concepts on, on these types of cases for all on four, all on six. And it's carefully designed to rehabilitate both the edentulous and the partially, the partially edentulous ridges. And they come in straight and angled uh, types of, 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 um, of uh, these types of attachments. And it's uh, 17 degrees and 30 degree variance and available on, on nine different collar heights, which is great. So uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of choices when it comes to these. So. And um, with, the, you know, with that said, when planning these cases, it's really important. I like to use at least a, a, some sort of surgical guide and 3D planning software. So you know, through cone beam computer tomography or CBCT images, they're designed to prepare an osteotomy and perform the correct implant placement utilizing the, the appropriate sleeves. So there's four major steps. We don't have time to go into everything all detailed today, but I just wanted to give you a little synopsis of what, what goes on when we're utilizing these surgical guides. And these four major steps are you know, diagnostic and data acquisition, virtual planning, surgical guide production, and surgical procedure. So let's talk about diagnostic data acquisition. Well, we have to look at bone volume, bone density, the anatomy of the area to be restored, the type of restoration, type of loading, the number of implants, aesthetics, and function. So all this comes into play when we're talking about diagnostic and data acquisition. And image technology for a precise digital plan and implant placement. And an impression can be taken conventionally or digitally. So then we move on to the virtual planning aspect of it. And we get a 3D data set or a DICOM, and it's imported directly into the appropriate planning software. It's then merged with a scanned impression or STL file. And those implants are then positioned in accordance with the patient's anatomy and desired outcome. And this gives us a precise area where we're going to be placing those implants and eventually utilizing those, those placements for our hybrid type denture. So then we go to the surgical guide production. This could be either done at the, uh, the milling center or the, uh, the implant company, or we can do it in our laboratories. And for this procedure itself, you know, we're going to secure the surgical guide Prepare the osteotomy line with recommended implant surgical instruments and the proper guided surgery kit in conjunction with the surgical protocol and the surgical guide indicate which instruments are needed at each site. And if you go to the, uh, a lot of the uh, implant uh, companies' websites, they give you all this protocol and using a PDF file. And these instruments, along with the surgical guide, they allow for the guided insertion of the implants. So what's our role in dental laboratory? Well, we help with case planning on implants, the denture type, occlusion. We'll work closely with the oral surgeon, the dentist, and the implant company in case planning. And we'll give in-office support the day of surgery with denture conversions and future case planning with mill bar prosthesis, whether it be a denture or a fixed type of case. You know, and you think back, you know, you know, I've done so many of these conversions over the years, and um, uh, it's, it's such a gratifying feeling when, when these things are done correctly and you have that proper case planning and you think about, say for, say, for instance, a patient is getting an immediate denture and implants placed the same day. Well, you say to yourself, this, is, this seems like really a traumatic uh, experience for the patient, you know, getting six or eight teeth extracted and then having four or six implants placed, uh, for instance, on an upper, and then going to the dental office and doing a, a chair side conversion on a denture or, or provisional. And uh, you say, that, that's a lot of trauma for the patient. But I tell you, most of the time I've seen these patients get up and walk out of the chair with a smile on, on their face, ready to go and uh, ready, to, ready, ready to eat or uh, just ready to fun function with their new prosthesis. And uh, it's very gratifying. So now the day of the surgery, we come into the dental office and we'll assist with the step-by-step -step procedure in converting removable prosthesis to a screw retained denture. And otherwise we're gonna, we're, we're gonna be chair side with you doing this. We'll get that denture. Uh, we'll we'll make sure it's positioned correctly. We'll help you with that. We'll we'll place help you place those temporary cylinders and help you with the screw retained uh, final outcome. Uh, I know things have been challenging during COVID, and we actually have had uh, virtual chair side assistance with the dental office with the uh, use of Zoom and uh, and video. So uh, that helps also. So the prosthetic procedure for the denture conversion. So say for instance, you have a provisional made, could be a new denture, an immediate denture or, or an existing denture. First thing we're going to do is 
fill that provisional with, with a heavy body VPS and pressure material. And we're gonna seat that prosthesis, prosthesis in the mouth and we wanna make sure the dental midline is consistent with the facial midline. As soon as that material has set up, we take it out and you can see the exact locations of where the implants are and where the abutments have been recorded. And uh, at this point, what I do, I take a small, uh, small bar and probably make like a 700 uh, type drill and I'll drill holes in the prosthesis and I'll drill right through the impression material and right through the denture. And as you can see in this photo on the bottom here, uh, I, drew some, I, I drill some small holes here. And then I start drilling a little larger so it compensates for the size of those temporary, uh, the temporary cylinders. Then we're gonna place the temporary cylinders onto the abutments and make sure everything is seated correctly. And then we're gonna try our provisional denture or our prosthesis over those low profile temporary cylinders. We wanna have a passive fit, something that's gonna go in and out of the mouth real easily and allow for the material to go around those cylinders and around the denture teeth or the denture base so we can process those subtemporary cylinders to the base. So this ensures that provisional prosthesis seats completely and it should not contact any of the restorative components. And at this point, what, what I suggest doing is taking a Sharpie and putting a mark right near the occlusal areas, maybe I'll show you right here on the screen, right near the occlusal areas here, my arrow is here, and even on the palatal area, uh, as, as far down as you can go, just place a, a little mark on there with a Sharpie. Take that denture out of the mouth, and then you take the temporary cylinders out, and remember where they go, and uh, either I'll do that, or you can do that in the, in the office, and cut, you can, you can cut that back down, you can cut those down. So you can cut them down on, in, in the mouth. It, it gets kind of hot. I recommend taking these cylinders out of the mouth, handing them to me, I'll cut them down, put them back in the mouth. And the reason why we're doing this, because we don't want anything to interfere with the occlusion. We went through all the trouble of making this prosthesis, even though this is temporary prosthesis, we want that patient to function. So when we have the correct occlusion, so the patient can bite down while, this is the, it's, while the material is curing around the temporary cylinders, then we're in good shape. So you see, we have a nice passive fit on a, on a lower picture here. I probably made these a little too big, but I just wanted to show you how much we, we should have around those uh, temporary cylinder areas. So they're all cut down, a patient can come into occlusion easily, and now we're ready to process the case. So before we do that, we wanna make sure that the rubber band covers all the surgical sites so that no acrylic resin will come into contact with the incision of sutures. And you know, years ago, we used to use a, 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 a cold cure acrylic or self cure acrylic. And I don't recommend it. There's so, there's so, you know, it's between the monomer taste, the burning sensation, and the possibility of locking things into place when they shouldn't, where they shouldn't be, is something that I don't want to take a chance with. So uh, there's some great new materials out there, which I'll talk about in a second, which they don't run, they don't, they don't, they don't run all over the place. They don't smell, they don't, you know, there's no taste to them. There's no heat generation and they work great for this type of procedure. So now we're gonna inject an autopolymerizing acrylic, acrylic resin around the base of the temporary cylinders. And what I'll do at first, like for instance, I'm using a material called Quick Up, which I'll show you in a second. I'll paint the primer around the acrylic or around the teeth, and then I'll, I'll inject, I'll put this in the mouth and inject, I'll have the doctor put it in the mouth, and then we'll inject around those cylinders. And uh, I, I, you know, don't be brave, too brave when you're doing this because I recommend doing maybe about three at a time. I, I've been in situations where the dentist would uh, try to cure six at a time, and this material it cures in about in about two minutes. So uh, you have you know there's not that much time to work with it. So if you do three at a time, even two or three at a time, you can inject this around a temporary cylinder, have the patient bite into occlusion, wait two minutes, have the patient open up again, and then you can cure the rest of the uh, temporary cylinders. And you know everything's going to be in place. Because let me tell you, I've, I've been through nightmares where the uh, the material started setting up and the uh, the clinician didn't have the seated all the way, and we had to ream out every single temporary cylinders and start from start from scratch. So just be just be careful when you're doing this type of procedure. So after this is done, we can take it out of the mouth. And if there's any voids on the tissue side with this material, uh, there's also a light cure material where you can fill in those voids and light cure for about 20 to 30 seconds. And then we're ready to get this denture uh, you know, ready for the patient by uh, cutting out the palate, reducing the borders and making it cleansable. So these are some of the chair side attachment processing materials. This is from Zest, it's called chair side. This works great also. It's uh, auto mixing, auto mix type of material with a syringe. My choice is QuickUp. I love this. This is from a company called Voco. 
And uh, as you can see here, it has a, it ha even has impression material that you can utilize. Uh, it has a syringe of it in, in impression material that you can utilize during your uh, conversion. And then it has your, uh, your primer, your regular quick up material and your light cure material, which if you, if you happen to miss some spots and you have some voids on the tissue side, you can utilize that light cure material. So this works very well. You don't have to worry about any taste or smell. It cures in two minutes. It finishes easily and polishes light very nicely also. And then you finish and polish the provisional prosthesis. And we, you know, if it's an upper, we cut out the palate, make it cleansable. Normally, I um, have about a millimeter space between the tissue and if the bar or the acrylic, or these types of cases, so the patient can cleanse those areas. Here's a couple of photos of the doctor doing this intraorally on a lower denture, I believe. Yeah, so doctor cure this intraorally with five implants and five temporary cylinders against an old, older denture here, uh, against the upper. And uh, you can see the upper was it also of an also a screw retained denture. Everything worked out really well. Doctor's really happy, has a bottle of champagne, ready to celebrate. And like I mentioned earlier before, it's a really gratifying experience when you're doing this and everything works out correctly and everything falls into place. Because think about it, think of all the planning that goes into this, you know, from the onset of the case, even up to the provisional uh, part of the case, and then even after the provisional, when we're planning for the final bar or hybrid type case. So let's talk a little bit about printed technology for hybrid transitional dentures. If you remember a, little, a few minutes ago, we were talking about surgical guides. Well, now we're able to use that, that technology that we utilize for surgical guides and uh, transfer it over to making the actual hybrid type denture or temporary provisional. And as you can see here, the, the surgical guide was utilized to print this particular denture here and uh, the teeth and the denture base was printed. But look at, look at the, the, uh, the access holes. They're already drilled for us. So this can go to your office and you can do, you could probably do this yourself without us there being there chair side and make sure everything seats correctly. And then you can start curing the temporary cylinders into this type of uh, provisional. So uh, I think this is the way of the future. You're gonna see less and less, I think, of those chair side conversions and more and more of these types of materials, whether it be milled or printed. So this is the material, this is how it looks after it's printed. There are things are trimmed down. We make it look nice, we, cl we clean it up and polish it and send it to the dental office for insertion. And we utilize the surgical guide for this. We utilize the same exact surgical guide we used earlier and, and we, uh, we improvised and we, we made the, uh, uh, the actual final provisional with this type of case. So there's a lot of different technologies out there that you can utilize uh, to make this happen. But this is a predictable way to do things. And that's why I like this because you know you want, you got that predictability at time after time the exact holes where the, where the implants are are gonna be uh, drilled out and it's gonna be easy to insert. And again, the print surgical guide was using, used, utilized for the printing of the transitional with access holes ready for the temporary cylinders, as you can see here. So that's pretty cool technology. And what, you know, what we're advancing as we speak every day, this new, new things evolving in the digital side of technology with dentistry, it's amazing. So it's exciting, it's exciting also. So there's your prepared printed traditional denture uh, with access holes, as you can see here on the right-hand side and the surgical guide on the left-hand side. The only thing I would say, I think these holes were drilled a little too large, but I would, I would probably make it a little, uh, little smaller when we, uh, on, the, uh, on the software when this is drilled, but this worked out great. This is an actual case that really worked out well. So let's talk a little bit more about hybrid dentures. And um, when we talk about hybrid dentures, you know, it's really important for the patient acceptance and we want to have you know, patient expectations met also. So let's talk about ex patient expectations. You know, I remember every time I go to Chicago, I'm on my way from the airport into downtown, uh, into the city, I see a sign that says, don't die with your teeth in the glass, you know? So, uh, and it talks about all four, all and six type of uh, restoration. So we don't want that to happen. We don't want people to have their dentures on their top pocket or in, in the glass. We want them to be able to function and look, have it aesthetic looking. You know, we're not making grandfather's or uh, grandmother's dentures anymore that, you know, years ago, it's, uh, we didn't have this technology. We didn't have the materials that we have now with denture teeth and, uh, and acrylics. These denture teeth look like natural teeth. They look like crowns. So they're not expected to be worn if put in your pocket or in a glass. You know, they're, they're expected to be functional. And uh, those are the ex expectations we have to talk to patients about. So this is a cool slide. I love this slide here. This is the relative functional capacity of the lower jaw. And look at the lower jaw with a lower denture. You're only at 10% functional capacity. It's amazing. 
and it goes all the way up to 60% with an implant denture, over denture rather, and all the way to 90% on an implant born denture, like a hybrid case. So it's amazing how we can raise that fun functional capacity of the jaw uh, with these types of cases. You know, and lower dentures have been pro problems over the years with sore spots moving around uh, and uh, not that much, that, the retention hasn't been that great. But with a simple two implant over denture, man, it's 60%, it's amazing. So uh, uh, I think it's, it's a, the choice over a full denture. And uh, as far as, you know, financially, it's not that much more money either. So it's a great, it's a great option for uh, patients who can't tolerate lower dentures or even upper dentures, as a, as a matter of fact. So let's look at some special considerations. You know, we have to look at and make sure there's adequate bone quantity um, and bone more than 12 millimeters to allow for at least 10 millimeters of height of the length of the implants. And this includes residual bone after tooth extractions. And this bone width is more than six millimeters to allow for at least four millimeters of the diameter of, of, the, diameter of the implants. A limited grafting can be accomplished at the time of implant placement. And some of the requirements, adequate restorative volume, at least 12 to 15 millimeters. And we'll show a picture of this in a little while. I would love to have at least 15 millimeters of uh, uh, intraocclusal intro space to work with these types of cases. We want an adequate AP spread, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, for the proper and optimal positioning of implants and to limit cantilevering, and adequate coverage of uh, the lip line to hide the transition zone. So, and some of the precautions you have to look at, bleeding disorders, uncontrolled metabolic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and so forth, and compromised immune system diseases. So let's look at the review here. Uh, lack of bone quantity, we, have, we want to look at that. We have a limited arch uh, or poor AP spread. Those are the things we have to have we take precautions with. Bone height less than 12 millimeters, bone width less than six millimeters. And a high smile line, because we have that high smile line when making a hybrid type case, uh, we, that transition line is got, not going to be too aesthetic. So we want to make sure in this instance, maybe we have to use a, an overdenture case where we can have a, a, a larger flange and the patient can take it in and out of the mouth and have it be cleansable also. So let's look at your anterior posterior spread or your uh, AP spread. The first thing we're going to do to get that number of the, uh, that, uh, of the AP spread, we draw a line through the center of the anterior most implant and a line through the distal most posterior implant. And we multiply that by 1.5. And this gives us the amount of uh, 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 leverage that we can have and the, the distance that the teeth can be cantilevered off the most distal implants. Because if we don't have that AP spread correct and we start putting uh, teeth, the first and second molars, way past that part, we're going to have a lot of uh, um, stress on that implant and you're going to have a failed implant. So uh, the good news is, you know, we used to do this by eye and, make, and, and do this in case planning. But now with the software that's available in planning out the bars and, and planning out these types of cases, it's already incorporated into the software. So it takes into consideration that AP spread. We also have to look at restorative space. You know, I think this photo here, we have plenty of restorative, restorative space in this type of photo here, but something like this, maybe not. You know, uh, there might have to be some bone reduction uh, here to, to compensate for that, the 15 millimeters that we need. Uh, for a bar and every all the other uh, components. So I'll take a look at this. This is a great chart right here. You know, it's adequate restorative volume that provides space for the implants, components, and the prosthesis, which is about 12 to 15 millimeters. So you got the abutment is three millimeters, the hybrid bar is three, the space between the denture teeth and the, and the uh, bar and the tissue is about one millimeter. Acrylic, I would love to get at least four millimeters and teeth at least four millimeters. So uh, all that is really important especially when you're grinding denture teeth over these types of uh, cases. You know, when you start grinding denture teeth, and I'll talk about denture teeth in a second here, but when you start grinding denture teeth, you're compromising and sacrificing the integrity of the strength of the tooth and also the shade of the tooth. And when you have uh, very little room for acrylic, this is when you're going to have some breakage on the, uh, away from the bar, on a, from the acrylic. So we want to make sure with all that uh, adequate restorative space is there when we're making these types of restorations. We talked about that transitional line or earlier, that junction between the natural pink and artificial pink affected by lip mobility, smile line, any amount of bone and the size of the teeth. You know, we don't want the patient to spend all this money on, on a nice hybrid type case and start smiling and you see a, a black, uh, black hole in there or a dark shadow. So uh, we have to really look at that transitional line also when we're playing in these cases. And tissue contact. 
I had mentioned earlier about at least one millimeter uh, space between the uh, denture and you know the bar and the tissue for cleansability. This particular case here, apparently it was we had some really uh, strong tissue contact and the patient had a reaction. It could have been the reaction with the acrylic also, <clears throat> with the monomer. Sometimes there's an allergic reaction like that between the monomer and the, and the tissue. Uh, but we, we need it to be cleansable. And there are times when that dentists would tell us at the, at the laboratory, you know, leave everything the way it is. I'll reduce uh, the amount of space between the tissue and the bar. I like to do that in the, uh, in the office, or the acrylic rather, in the office. So we want to make sure that there's that, that cleansability, because let me tell you, if this is not cleansable and that patient is wearing this, uh, this hybrid type provisional for at least four to six months, it's going to be a problem with hygiene. And I've been in the office when this has been taken out and it's not that pleasant, let me tell you, and you want to make sure it's cleansable. So let's talk about protocol and how to do this type of case planning on these cases. The first thing we need from you is a preliminary impression, and then we're going to make a custom tray and then send you either a closed tray or an open tray for the second impression. And at this point, we'll get it back at the laboratory. We'll pour a soft tissue cast on this, and, uh, and then we're ready to make our verification index. And when we make our verification index, we want to verify that our model is correct and that the impression was correct. Because we go through the whole procedure of making a bar now, those bars are very expensive and remakes aren't paid for. So they charge us for remakes. So we want to make sure that that impression and a master cast is as accurate as possible. And at this point, we're going to make a base plate and birim at the same time. And so we're going to send you the verification index and the base plate and birim. And usually I'll put one temporary cylinder in the birim so it stays in place. And if everything looks good, the next step will go to a tooth setup. You see on number four here. This way you can check occlusion, aesthetics, and make sure everything is good. So uh, everything looks good. We're going to take this and send it off to where the bar is being milled. And uh, we send this out. And then in a, in a few days, we'll get a verification JPEG or a 3D image to show us where the position of this bar is. And if everything looks great, if the position is good, there aren't any adjustments, then we can go and have that bar milled. This gets sent back to us at the lab, and we do a second try-in with the bar and, at the, and the teeth. Everything looks good for the teeth try-in with the bar, then we go to our finish. So it's pretty much seven steps here, as you can see. Okay, let's just really quickly go through it. Fabricate a soft tissue mop for the master cast. There's your verification index and the wax occlusal rim. Verify that cast is correct. And even when you're taking your bite registrations on these types of cases, it's just, it's just important for us to get the proper information, especially on an upper case. We still need that midline, the cuspid line, the high lift line, the low lift line to help guide us to where, these, where to set these denture teeth. And this is the material I use for the uh, verification index. It's called Primatech or Prima Splint. Very nice material, no shrinkage, no, no expansion. And what I'll do is I'll wrap it around the temporary cylinders. I'll put it in a light cured unit for maybe about uh, three minutes. And it, take it, you take it out, trim it up, and there you have your verification index. And if you have a full arch case that's going across arch, I recommend, you know, uh, on these verification indexes, maybe get, getting a disc and slicing these, uh, these verification indexes in a couple of spots here, then looting it together with either Doralay or some light cure material, just to make sure that's uh, nice and accurate. And what we'll do back at the lab, we'll get uh, we'll do an altered cast model, and it'll be nice and accurate. So now we're ready to test. Comes back to the laboratory after the bite rim and the verification index is verified, and we're ready to set our teeth for denture trying. And some of you have seen some of this before, but setting denture teeth, we want to utilize to correct articulators, especially with uh, full mouth reconstruction. I like to utilize a semi-adjustable or fully adjustable articulator. So how do we select anterior teeth? Well, usually facial form equals tooth form. And you know, we, I'm dividing the, this face here on the left here just to show you what, what, we, what we need when we're looking at a denture setup and what we need on a, a, the occlusal rim. So we take into consideration the pupil line, which is the occlusal plane, smile line, the high lip line, the midline, the cuspid lines, and all this comes into play when we're setting up our denture teeth. So it's so important for us to get, even to get a, a digital photo and the correct information on the occlusal rim. So now we're picking out denture teeth. We have to determine the mold by either the shape of the arch. If you look at an upper arch or an upper model um, and you look at it and you turn it upside down, it looks like a denture tooth. So it can be a square arch, a square tapering arch, an ovoid arch. So all these years I'm doing this type of technology, I pick my denture teeth by the shape of the arch. 
and it worked out well. Or you can measure uh, by measuring the cuspid lines on the pipe block and then go to the tooth chart and the tooth chart will let you know what size tooth to pick. So all concerns in the width of the six anteriors, the shape of the centrals, uh, shape of uh, and the anteriors, and of course the shape. I mentioned earlier tooth form equal facial form, especially on those anterior teeth on the centrals. I go by this rule all the time. Square tooth, square face, tapering face, tapering tooth, and so on. Then we have some natural anatomical landmarks also. The tips of the canines are usually equal to the width of the nose, and the width of the canines are usually equal to the width of the philtrum. We want harmonious aesthetics when we set up our denture teeth, something to look natural, uh, and it's something that's gonna wear, have a good wear factor, and uh, something that's gonna be aesthetic. So let's talk about briefly using the correct denture teeth. You know, we want a tooth that's gonna be strong because it's a fact that with hybrid cases and even implant over denture cases, denture teeth wear a lot qu more quickly than they do with normal uh, full upper and full denture. So we want something that's gonna have a, a strong uh, uh, type of tooth, a tooth that's gonna have natural morphology, tissue friendly, plaque resistant, and chip free gr uh, grinding because there are a lot of denture teeth out there. You know, there's so many different denture tooth companies out there. Some of these denture teeth out there, the uh, more inferior ones, as soon as you grind through that first layer, you're getting to a softer layer. So if you're adjusting occlusion and getting through that first layer, you're already down to a soft layer. What's gonna happen now if, if that patient starts wearing that, uh, that implant denture? That tooth is gonna wear pretty quickly. So you wanna make sure you have a good tooth, either Vita, you have uh, Ivoclar, Colzer, I know Vita has some ceramic fillers in their teeth to wear like natural dentitions, same size as natural teeth. And I like lingual anatomy on the anterior teeth for better phonetics. As you can see here, this is one of the setups here. Uh, and we have a uh, rugae and natural uh, and, and anterior uh, uh, aesthetics on here. So uh, it it's really helps with phonetics and it helps when the patient, especially new, new, new denture patients, it helps them with the, the way they speak. And the wider occlusal surface aids in chewing and swallowing, and is great for implant retained cases. So we're just gonna briefly go over the anterior and posterior setups here. And uh, we want the anteriors positioned individually and parallel to the pupil line. We talked about occlusal schemes. You know, 72% of laboratories use semi-anatomical or anatomical teeth. I like to use anatomical teeth, uh, and I like to utilize lingualized occlusion when we're setting uh, teeth on these implant type cases. And these are some of the different uh, various occlusal schemes that you can choose from. Lingual contact, combination, semi-anatomic and anatomic. I don't like to use monoplane, so because uh, it, it, you really can't tear your food effectively with monoplane teeth. So when I'm setting my posterior teeth, I'm aligning the occlusal surfaces towards the center of the cranium, which is your curve of Wilson. And that's my normal, normal type of setup for like a full upper, full lower denture. When I'm setting lingualized occlusion, I'm not gonna have my curve of speed. I'm not gonna have that, uh, uh, those occlusal surfaces towards the center of the cranium. I'm gonna have more of a flat type of uh, setup here, but I'm gonna have my curve of speed, but not my curve of Wilson. And the reason being, I want that lingual cusp of the upper to go right into the central fossa of those lower teeth to reduce any off axis stress on the implant or the denture. We want a harmonious transition to the posteriors and an individual, individualized setup here, as you can see right here. So this is one of my wax ups I do for a try-in. And this, this is a lingualized occlusion, like I mentioned before. You can see that lingual cusp going right into the central fossa of the lower. And it's for the implant supported over denture and it reduces the lateral side to side forces on the implant and lateral forces could cause the implant to fail. And those buccal cuffs are flared out a little bit uh, more than, than usual and actually pushes the cheek away so it eliminates cheek biting also. And of course, I, I like to push my, my, uh, my wax ups, my anatomical wax ups here. Uh, these anatomical wax ups really make it different when the patient sees these dentures. You know, you, you have diagnostic wax ups to crown a bridge where we can have a nice, nice characterized wax up for a denture so the patient can see what that final denture is going to look like. And many times the doctor will ask us, you know, to mimic the patient's natural gingiva, not only in a wax up, but the final, final prosthesis also. And we could do that now with our special denture based stains. And there's your different color waxes in there for the natural try-in. Okay. So we had the try-in and everything looks good. Now we're ready to have to send the uh, bar to the uh, implant company and have it milled. 
And what we do now, we, we get a putty index and the soft tissue model will send. And that putty index, I take a putty index of the denture setup. And this is gonna give uh, the uh, milling uh, facility an idea of how much room they have between the bar and the denture teeth. So there's a putty index of the putty matrix of the, the denture setup. And you can see here on this, this final bar here that was milled the, the amount of space between the denture teeth and the, and the bar. And then after a few days, we'll get, this is a happens to be a noble procera. We get a photo, a 3D photo back in the laboratory. We want to make sure everything's lined up correctly. The access hole, holes are in the uh, right position. As you can see here, we get all these 3D uh, uh, views of this uh, mill bar with the denture. And sometimes we have to make adjustments. Sometimes I'll tell them to pull that bar in because it's going to interfere with the denture teeth. Well, those access holes have to be a little bit differently and placed a little bit differently. So uh, once we approve this, the bar is made and then we get it back to the laboratory. Here's your bar, nice hybrid type bar. And it says a lot of different bars out there you can choose from. Wraparound bar, I don't utilize this that much anymore. I'm mainly using the hybrid type bar. This is a round bar. Years ago with these round bars, you had a lot of breakages on these bars. Uh, this is what I like, the hybrid bar design. And uh, this seems to work out well. You know, and with my uh, technique of opaguing the bar and creating a tremendous bond between the bar and the opaque and a great bond between the opaque and the denture base acrylic, I haven't seen a breakage off a bar in over six years. So once this comes back to the laboratory, we're ready to transfer that wax try-in over to the implant bar. And I do this very easily. I'll take a putty index and a putty matrix of the existing setup. I'll close it down, the setup into the, into the putty. And many times those denture teeth will come uh, in, in, uh, over to this side where the putty is. And all I have to do now is take that brand new bar, screw it onto the model. I usually want to use one or two screws. I'll mark where those screws are. I'll put some hot molten wax in that uh, where those denture teeth are. I put those denture teeth back in the putty. All I do is close that articulator down until that pin hits. I know I have the exact bite. I have everything cool, so I open that articulator and everything comes over onto, onto the bar side. So here we have a nice uh, transfer of the denture setup from the regular original setup over to the hybrid bar. All I have to do now is clean it up, send it back to you at the dentist and to try it in one more time. And I make those access, access holes available and we're ready to send it. And there's the final wax up on the bar. Once we get that bar, uh, try it in again with the denture setup, everything looks good with the, uh, the occlusion, the fit, we're ready to process the case. And this happens to be a Montreal bar, which is, I like this design because it's more of a finish type, uh, finish line on the, on the lingual aspect of these cases here. So what I'll do next, once it comes back to the laboratory, and they do this now at the milling centers too. They can do this for, so at the milling centers as far as opaguing. I take a material called VMLC, and it's a, it's a multiple step material uh, procedure. And I'll paint this bar right before it's gonna be processed. And I use a pre-opaque material, they opaque it, it, that creates a tremendous bond between the, the bar and the, uh, and, and the uh, opaque. And it comes in all different various colors to match acrylics. You can see it over here. I have this ready to go, ready to process. I process the case. This is kind of a crazy case here. Look how posterior that, uh, that implant on the right-hand side is. This worked out great though. So I process the case. I don't have to worry about that bar showing through the acrylic. And it worked out great. So. Is a little example of the opaqueing the bar. You have a nice, nice. Uh, you don't want to see that. You know all that all that trouble you went through to, to process these cases and and plan these cases to make it look aesthetic. You don't want that gray coming through the bar or showing near the teeth. So real quickly, I'm going to talk about denture processing techniques. I like the injection technique. I also like an acrylic that's going to give a natural look, a low shrinkage factor, a variety of gingival shades, something that's going to be a great bond to the denture teeth impact resistance, have flexural strength, good finishing and polishing properties, and something that's gonna be color and fit, uh, have color and fit stability. And I use Diamond D. There's a lot of acrylics out there. You have uh, um, acrylic from Ivoclar, the Ivory Base system is great. Um, and uh, those, my two are pretty much my favorites are the Diamond D and the Ivory Base material. These are different shades that you can choose from. These are the dentures I made for uh, different shades here. And then if we really want to uh, match the patient's natural gingiva, we can add denture-based stain to it. Real simple. We prepare the surface. We have a picture of the patient's natural gingiva, and I start adding different colors to this to emulate the, the different appearances. And then it starts looking natural. I, put, I start layering this, and this probably took me about 10 minutes maybe to do this. So 
I light cure it in, the, in between each layer. I finish and polish it, and there's your final results. So denture-based sanding could be really a really uh, a good function when the patient really wants to match that natural gingival on these types of cases. And this is a real dramatic one here. Uh, this case was um, uh, had some uh, gingival stain. This was with physio dense denture teeth and some gingival stain. I think this was, this was um, uh, a heat cure type of gingival stain called Candelar. Unfortunately, we didn't get a picture with the, the case in the mouth here. So we just got the patient just uh, halfway smiling here. So we couldn't see the way the gingival looked in the mouth here. So with that, I'm going to end this uh, presentation with an article that I wrote. And this has to do a little bit of an overdenture type case here. And this was an IDT magazine, Inside Dental Technology, a few years back. And I got a call from a dentist in North Carolina. I was li living there in North Carolina, managing a lab. And Dr. Merrill called me and he said, Dennis, I have a patient here. He's 18 years old and he's gone through high school wearing orthodontic bands and a couple of denture teeth on the orthodontic band. <clears throat> he's got had health problems and he's been made fun of, he's been bullied and let's, let's try to do something right for the patient. He goes, but I really don't know where to go with this type of case. So what we did, you know, the doctor took an impression. I took everything back to the laboratory. I sat in my office trying to figure out what to do on this case. I mean, it took me hours just to, I'm staring at this articulation in the case. So the patient couldn't tolerate any implants. So we did uh, post and core attachments. And what I did after the, uh, he did the prep for the post and core, I waxed up some copings and I put some equator attachments on here. Uh, and um, I'm gonna make this like an overdenture case. So we casted these, uh, uh, these copings, as you can see here, came out really nice. We're gonna, we're gonna snap on those equator attachments on top of those copings. Doctor cemented them in the mouth took an impression, some impression analogs. I got it back to the laboratory, report a model. And this is what the case looked like on an articulator. You could see the malocclusion over here and it's almost like a class three bite. So at this point I had to decide what I'm gonna do with this case, what am I gonna do? I, I looked at it and I came up with a solution. I said, let's do a special type of framework when over denture attachments internally. So I waxed up some denture teeth, I made a putty index and then I took that putty index off and I, 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 what I did, I injected a framework. And when I, before I injected this framework, I took out the denture teeth and injected the framework. And these teeth that you see here, this is called acetyl resin or duracetyl material. Very strong material, comes in various shades. And what I'm going to do now is set those denture teeth over the mesh area. So it's almost like a partial denture framework with dent these denture teeth already incorporated into the, the framework here. So, but this is actually duracetyl material acetyl resin. But I wanted to make it look a little more aesthetic. So I added some composite material around the gingiva, as you can see here, made it look aesthetic. And this, you can see how nice those denture teeth look, because I used a good denture tooth. I think it was an ivochloric tooth on this. And now what I want to do is set my remaining denture teeth. And I want to go like almost to an edge to edge type of classification here. So I set it up to set these denture teeth up and I'm ready to go, ready to process the case. And you could see it's almost like a snap on smile. It goes over that, uh, that, that last molar here and compensates for that uh, malocclusion. This had gone over that bicuspid area and compensates malocclusion. And I processed the um, attachments internally, as you can see, these are the Ryan 83 equator attachments. And I was kind of worried about cleansability here. So what I took, I took a material called Versacryl. It's a soft liner material that warms up with the heat, uh, with the heat of the mouth and it creates sort of like a gasket. So I put this gasket material internally. And I remember I was in California. I got a call from Dr. Merrill and he said, Dennis, the patient that Josh is coming in on Monday, would you like to be here? I said, definitely. I said, this case was, took a long time to do, a lot of planning. And all of us chipped in. We did this pro bono. Nobody didn't charge the patient anything. And uh, so I walked in on Monday morning. And there's Josh on the left before we got the case. And this is him on the right. And the doctor snapped this case right in. No adjustments at all. The patient absolutely loved it. And uh this patient really was one of my most successful cases that I've ever done. And this is Josh with the new case here. So uh, worked out really well. And um, I, this is a few years back. So I'm, I'm imagining he's probably gonna need another case pretty soon. So, uh, but he was so happy. His mother hugged me. He said to me, he goes, uh, Mr. Urban, I thank God for what you do. You did. He said, now I know what it feels like to have natural teeth. So, uh, and the latest I heard, Josh is getting married and he's, he's a missionary. He's traveling all around the world now. So, uh, uh, good for him. So that was one of my favorite cases. So I'd like to share that with you. That was IDT Magazine, uh, two months articles. 
artistry, artistry through denture technology and communication. So I thank everybody for being with us today. If anybody has any questions at all, please ask me. I'll, I'm here for a little while longer. And uh, thank you for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, everybody in the audience. We do appreciate your time, attention, and participation today. Uh, the link has been posted up in the chat box for the next education uh, opportunity. It is a clear perspective on partial dentures, which will be happening Tuesday, April 20th at 8 a.m. Eastern. Um, and with that, I do not see any questions in the chat box or Q&A. Okay. So Dennis, thank you so much for the great uh, content today and the story with Josh. I was no, you're welcome. hearing my pleasure. that story. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, and I will turn it over to you to close us out then. Okay, great. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks everybody for joining us today. And uh, we hope you had a special positive learning experience today. Where you apply your knowledge and expertise in a positive way in a way that will enhance your careers and self-work. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time. Have a time. great day, everybody. Bye-bye now.